Message on your cell phone oh, saying, then, you left your bag. Yeah, I was up at Branson last year in this uh, Albert yeah, Street. It's just awkward, like, what happened to you? They're like, hey, the light is too far to the right. Yeah. <laughs> and then they're like, bring the wind more forward. And I'm like, out? And no, it's like, I'm going to record it. I'm like, I'm going to record it. It felt so awkward.
I mean, it will be different. It's vague, but it's not like, it's not like this. I don't understand how it is. Yeah, it's just like, it's not like you're just standing in the hallway right now. I'm sorry, I got uh, stuck in traffic this morning. So what we're going to talk about this morning is whether or not Parkinson's disease is a prion disease. And uh, this is a real popular subject right now. Um, my objectives are to briefly discuss the cell biology of protein production, provide a brief overview of prion diseases, Describe the role of alpha synuclein in Parkinson's disease, and describe the evidence that Parkinson's disease is a prion disease. I don't have any conflicts of interest. So, one of the things I think about a lot are protein accumulations and um, how these relate to neurodegenerative disorders. And if you look in the 10th edition, of Adams and Victor, which is the current edition. There's still a chapter on degenerative diseases of the nervous system. And so a lot of these diseases, if not most of them, relate to accumulation, abnormal accumulation of proteins in the nervous system. And these are some of the proteins that accumulate in the nervous system. One is alpha synuclein, and these are the diseases that I deal with mostly. So the alpha synuclein neuropathies include Parkinson's disease, dementia with fluid bodies, and MSA. And you also have accumulations of tau, and the diseases that you see with accumulations of tau includes Alzheimer's disease, PSP, frontotemporal dementia, particle basal degeneration, progressive uh, aphasia, primary progressive aphasia. You also see accumulations of amyloid in Alzheimer's disease, and you also see this in Parkinson's disease with dementia. 
TDP 43, you see accumulations of STD and ALS. Plus, you see accumulations of MFTD and ALS. And also, you see accumulations of prion protein and CJD. Now, these are all normal proteins, uh, except for amyloid. These all are present in the CNS, normal. And they don't cause trouble until they begin to accumulate in neurons in the CNS. Okay, so this is what, this is my outline for what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk a little bit about protein production, prions, PD, pathology, and evidence that alpha synuclein spreads as a prion, and then I'll summarize this. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about protein production. Okay, so transcription and translation. I'm not a cell biologist, but I'll talk a little bit about this just to uh, remind us all about what this is about. <coughs> In the human gene, we have promoter, a promoter area and a tata area, followed by exons and introns. And um, through a process of transcription, these are pasted are transcribed onto RNA. Okay, this is the primary transcript uh, that we see with RNA. This is spliced to remove the introns so that we have these mature RNAs. And these are sent to the cytoplasm. And there, we develop precursor proteins where these are translated onto proteins. And then these are adapted. This is a little bit more sophisticated uh, picture of this. So we have the DNA in the nucleus which is transcribed onto messenger RNA, which leaves the nucleus. And this moves to ribosomes. And in the small unit of the ribosomes, the uh, RNA is uh, transcribed onto So we have these formations of these proteins. Okay, now, once these proteins are formed, they undergo conformation. So this is the primary structure of an amino acid sequence, such as we can see here. And because of um, hydrogen bonding, sulfur binding, these are folded into a secondary structure. And the two secondary structures that these can be folded into are alpha, alpha helices and beta sheets. Okay. Now, once these are folded into these, they then undergo further conformation in a tertiary structure, which is a three-dimensional and they can undergo further folding into a quaternary structure. So the secondary structure is the result of hydrogen bonding. And the two secondary structures that you see with proteins are alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. Okay, let's talk a little bit about. So prions are proteinaceous infectious particles. And in 1967, it was proposed 
that these prions are devoid of nucleic acid. And this was an incredible thing. When I was a resident, I was taught that prion diseases, CJD, were slow proteins, or, slow, or actually uh, that they were uh, <coughs> slow viruses. Were and you here when Gajicek visited this? Yes. And he was, at that time, he was a world of far. He was. Yeah. And uh, that, that was a great talk that he gave. And, uh, he started talking when he got off the airplane, and he was talking when he left. You know, he just talked, talked, talked. <laughs> uh, so we now know that uh, the prions don't have any DNA and uh, that they're resistant to uh, acids, nucleic acid inactivation procedures, and that they are infectious. Okay, so let's talk about the prion protein. Prion protein is a normal protein. We all have it. It's in our brains. And uh, uh, in our brains, predominantly, it has an alpha helical proteosensitive structure. Now, in some people, uh, this alpha helical structure undergoes transformation into predominantly a beta sheet protease resistant transformation. Okay, so here's an example of this. So we see a normal prion protein here, and it's predominantly these alpha helices, and there's a little bit of beta sheet structure. Mm -hmm. In these proteins. Now, when these become diseased, what they turn into is less of the alpha helix structure and more of the beta or, or of the beta sheet structure and the aggregate that become insoluble. So this this is a list of prion diseases, and if we look at animal diseases. The most common one is scraping. And scraping is actually fairly common. It's a prion disease that occurs in sheep and it's been identified in about 45 states in the United States. So it, it, it's a very common disease. Um, another one is transmissible mink encephalopathy, chronic wasting disease in mule deer and elk. And uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy in cattle, which is a man made disease that occurred in uh, the UK. Uh, in humans, the prototypical prion disease is Kuru, and this occurred in the 4A people. Um, and this was due to uh, what it was due to was people eating the brains of other humans who had died. And uh, it's actually fairly comparable to bovine spongiform encephalopathy. And so these people and it was predominantly the women who ate the brains of these ancestors who had died. And uh, they developed this, this uh, disease, which was a rapidly progressive dementia of And uh, uh, it was cured. Fortunately, this has been eradicated for the most part. Dr. Lucy alluded to Dr. Gedges came here and gave a talk on this. 
And he was really the person who uh, discovered the cause of this, and he eliminated it. And uh, so it's gone now. We don't see this anymore. Now, the other human prion diseases include hyatrogenic CJP and variant CJP, familial CJP, gershwin schroeser schacker disease, and fatal familial insomnia. And um, these um, are still around. We see these. The, the incidence of, of uh, incidental sporadic CJP is about one in a million. So we, we see one or two cases a year of CJP. Okay, this is from the Annals of Neurology in 1994, and this shows the prion diseases that were prevalent at that time. And most of these were CJD, and most of them were sporadic cases of CJD. There were some familial cases and some iatrogenic cases. There was still a little bit of cougar around at that time, but it's gone now. I personally have never seen a case of familial CJD. All of the cases I've seen have been sporadic. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the biochemistry of prions. So prion protein P, uh, is, is uh, comes from the PRNPG, and this is on the short arm of chromosome 20. There are two isoforms of this. There's cellular prion protein, and there's scrapey form of prion protein. And the difference between these lies in codon 129 of the prion protein gene, and uh, or the prion protein protein. And if if you're homozygous for serine instead of valine in codon 129, you're susceptible to get CJD. If you're homozygous for valine, codon not likely to get CJD. Okay, um, so let's talk about cellular prion protein. It's a normal intracellular membrane bound protein. We don't know the function of normal prion protein. Uh, the normal conformational structure is a four alpha helix structure with minimal beta sheet structure. Um, we do know that in knockout prion protein mice, they're asymptomatic. They don't have any problems. So we, we don't really know what the function of the, the normal prion protein is. Now, back in the early 2000s, Stanley Brewster, who I was fortunate enough to hear talk this week, uh, talked about protein X, and protein X is a chaperone protein that binds to the to the uh, carboxy terminal prion protein, and um, it results in a conformational change greater with greater expression of beta sheet in scrapey form of prion protein, where there's serine uh, amino acids in codon 129. So again, the mechanism of the neurotoxicity is uncertain. But we do know that uh, codon 129 is very important in prion protein. If you have valine, again, uh, if you're homozygous for valine, if, if prion protein codon 129, you're not going to get CJD. If you
you have, if you're homozygous for serine, you put on 129, you're susceptible to it. Okay, so what about the replication of conformational information by prions? We know that there is initial misfolding of, norm, of the normal form into prion form. And that this serves as a template to uh, cause the beta sheet transformation of uh, other prion proteins so that you have others that form and that these act on other uh, prion proteins that are normally present. And so you have a progression of the formation of prion protein. So this is the neuropathology of CJD. This is this is an H and E stain. And what you see is are these absent uh, vacuole changes and uh, we also see some microglia present. And with higher power, you can see these inclusion bodies. And what this is, is accumulation of prion protein intracellularly in these neurons. Here's another slide that shows an H and E stain uh, where you see these vacuolar changes. And uh, we see some microglia, and we see some neurons. And in these neurons, we see these accumulations of this protein. And this is a silver stain, which stains the intracellular accumulation of these proteins. OK. Now, let's switch gears and talk about PD. Pathology of PD. Okay, so PD was first descri described in 1870 by Dr. James Parkinson. And uh, he said it was an involuntary tremulous motion with lessened muscular power, the parts not in action, and even when supported, with a propensity to bend the trunk forward and to pass from a walking to a running pace. Destination, the senses and the intellects being uninjured, and this is his. Uh, this is the title page from his original description. He must have been a pretty old man when he described it. Well, he was born yeah. in 1755. Oh, that's Saturday. his birth. Okay, I thought that was when the picture was taken. No. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this is a picture that was, or a figure that was drawn by Gowers that shows Camptoformia and uh, also kind of shows the, the festination that people with PD had. So there are four major motor manifestations of PD, bradykinesia, rest tremor, rigidity, and postural instability. And they're also increasing, well, there's a lot of increasing interest in the non-motor symptoms of PD, including depression, dementia, autonomic dysfunction, sleep disorders, GI problems, paresthesia, and pain. And in fact, in my PD patients, I find myself increasingly uh, spending more time dealing with the non-motor symptoms Okay, so how do we define Parkinson's disease? Um, can we differentiate it from other disorders? So there are a few ways that people have looked at this. One way is clinical. And the Queen Square Brain Bank criteria call for the presence of bradykinesia. You've got to have bradykinesia. <coughs> plus rest tremor, 
form rigidity or postural stability. So if you have bradykinesia plus one of these others, then you have Parkinson's. Parkinsonism. Now, Parkinsonism is not equal to PD. There are things other than PD that cause Parkinson's. Another way to look at it is pharmacological. How do they respond to L double? Well, this is a trick. Uh, what, one of the things I see now in PD patients is under treatment. Uh, I see a number of patients who are put on Cinemat 25100 TID. They don't get better, and they're sad. They don't have PD. Well, that's under treatment. Uh, one of my favorite patients is a man who had that done to him, and he didn't get better, and he wound up in a nursing home. And I saw him increased his L dopa and he's out of the nursing home, he's got married for the second time, he's driving his tractor, and he's happy as he can be. And that's that, that that's actually a fairly common scenario at this point in time. Uh, how much do you how much L dopa do you have to give someone before you can say they're not responsive? Uh, Stanley Fond says two grams. I like to see if you get at least one gram a day before I say they're not responsive to my uh, Another way you can uh, define PD is by imaging. And mm -hmm. there's not much on MRI that helps you. MRI will help you in diagnosing Parkinson's plus syndromes, such as PSP and MSA. But it really doesn't help you in diagnosing PD. DAT scans, dopamine transfer, uh, transporter scans are helpful in some situations. And uh, but there's a word of caution about them. One is they don't differentiate between PD and Parkinson's pulse. So people with PSP are going to have abnormal DAT scans. People with MSA are going to have abnormal DAT scans. Uh, the, and so I think you have to be really selective about who you want to do something. The people that I, there, there really are two scenarios where I find DAT scans helpful. One is if I think someone has a psychogenic tremor. Uh, the other is if I uh, believe, or, or if I see someone and I really just can't tell whether they have EP or PD, then that scan can be helpful in that situation. Uh, they do that scans here? Yes. The, uh, the best way to diagnose PD is pathological. And uh, what you see pathologically is loss of pigment and neurons in the substantia nigra and accumulation of Lewy bodies. Uh, there also are genetic tests that you can do. And about 20% of PD, well, about 20% of Parkinsonism is monogenetically determined. And I don't really consider those people to have PD. Um, I think they had, well, a, a, a good example is Parkin. Okay, so Parkin is the most common autosomal recessively inherited um, Parkinsonism. And it typically uh, begins at a younger age. And one of the interesting things about these people is that they don't have Lewy bodies. Okay, so I don't believe that you can really call Parkin mutations uh, that cause Parkinsonism PD because I think I, I think it's just a, a different disease. Okay, 
So let's talk about alpha synuclein. So there's a family of synucleins uh, that includes alpha, beta, and gamma synucleins. And uh, the only one that we're really concerned about is alpha synuclein. So alpha synuclein localizes to the nerve terminal and it inhibits neurotransmitter release when it's overexpressed. Now, knockout of alpha synuclein has only a modest effect on synaptic transmission. It doesn't cause a lot of problems. It causes some, but not a lot of problems. Native alpha synuclein adopts predominantly a soluble alpha helix conformation with very few beta sheets. And that's what keeps it soluble. In neurodegen neurodegeneration, alpha synuclein misfolds and aggregates as insoluble beta sheets. It's ubiquinated and accumulates as Lewy pathology. Okay, so here's the Lewy body, and we see this intracellularly here in this neuron. And here's a bigger picture of it. And this is immunohistochemical staining. Okay, so in the in the middle here, what we see is ubiquinated protein. And on the rim here, what we see is alpha synuclein. This is stained with immunohistochemically stained with alpha to, to alpha synuclein. And uh, that's what a little body is. Now we didn't know what a, what a little body was until 1997. And in 1997, they discovered that a Lewy body is ubiquinated alpha synuclein. And that really was a, a, a benchmark. It really opened the door for research into what caused the accumulation of these things. Okay, now, Here's a big deal, the Brock hypothesis. And this is a, a, a hypothesis of Parkinson's disease. And uh, Heiko Brock is a very humble German neuropathologist. Uh, actually, I, I, was, I was able to hear uh, Professor Brock present his findings. At, uh, at one of the movement disorders conferences in, in New Orleans, shortly after he published it, and uh, very eloquent uh, presentation. So he presented this and published it in 2003, and this was an autopsy study. And what he did was he took a bunch of brains and he immunohistochemically stained them for alpha synuclein. He looked at 18 brain regions, and he had 41 patients who had been clinically diagnosed with PD. He had 69 subjects who had no clinical diagnosis of PD, but who were found to have Lewy bodies and Lewy neurons. And what he found uh, were six stages of Parkinson's pathology. So stage one begins in the medulla in the dorsal motor nucleus of him. Okay, so these are people whose pathology, they only have Lewy bodies in the, in the dorsal motor nucleus of him. Stage two patients have Lewy bodies in the medulla and the pontine tegumentum, including the locus ceruleus. Stage three patients have blue bodies in the midbrain uh, in the suspension nigra. So people don't become symptomatic with PD until they reach stage three pathologically. In stage four, they go up the blue bodies progress up into the mesocortex, stage five into the neocortex, and stage six further up into and this is a drawing from uh, Brock's original 
paper. This shows us this page one is limited to the uh, dorsal nucleus of the pen with very low pathology elsewhere. Stage two goes up into the locus really as a pit setting. And with stage six, you see extensive neocortical involvement. Now, this doesn't work for everybody. Uh, if you look at the Sydney study, the Sydney study was a, a very important epidemiological study of PD that was done in Australia. And in the Sydney study, uh, they followed patients over a 20-year period. And about um, <coughs> 85 to 90 percent of PD patients became demented over that period of time because of neocortical involvement of the pathology. But there were these 10 to 15 percent of patients who never became And uh, we don't really understand why that is. I think it's because PD is not a single disease. Now, I think most people with PD fit into Brock's classification, but I think there's a subclass of people with PD who don't fit into it. Okay, so this is another illustration of the Brock hypothesis. So the pathology begins down here in the in the dorsal motor nucleus, and it spreads up in the brain stem, up into the cortex, and into the neocortex. Okay, to switch gears and talk about the evidence that alpha synuclein spreads is prion. So let's talk about cell culture studies. So this is one study I want to describe. These were hex cell cultures. And these cells expressed alpha synuclein either in GFP or, or DS red cells. Okay, so the GFP cells are green and the DS red cells are red. Now, confocal microscopy show double label hex cells after five days of stability of hex cells fused to alpha synuclein, GFP or DS red. And these cells were co-cultured with a human melanoma cell model. And after various days of co-culture, cells were immunohistochemically stained with alpha synuclein. Okay, so here we have GFP uh, cells, and this is with alpha synuclein uh, attached to the GF the, the cells. And uh, so we see the green fluorescence here of the cells, and these are DS red cells that have alpha synuclein fused to them. And so we see the DS red cells. And if you fuse them, this is what you see. Okay, this is confocal microscopy after five days of co culture with Keck cells. So these are the melanoma cells that are cultured along with the uh, uh, Keck cells. And you start to see these accumulations. And what these are, are accumulations of alpha synuclein. And if you look at time over a seven day period, these are the percentage of cells that were double labeled with confocal microscopy. And so what we see is at day one, we see about three and a half percent of cells that uh, also have alpha synuclein in the culture cells, the melanoma cells. And this increases, and at day seven, we see about 9% of melanoma cells that have begun to accumulate alpha synuclein. 
And so this is an example of cell-to-cell -cell transmission of alpha-synuclein. So this is kind of a summary, uh, a selective summary. This isn't all the, the, the evidence that we have. But this is a selective summary of cell culture in animal studies. So transgenic mice expressing mutant human alpha-synuclein can be secreted by exocytosis and taken up by unaffected neurons by endocytosis. Uh, Alpha-synuclein transfer between host cells and grafted cells overexpressing human alpha-synuclein. That's a study we just looked at. We also have evidence of inoculation of young transgenic mouse brains with insoluble alpha-synuclein aggregates, which leads to earlier onset of behavior abnormalities in alpha-synuclein aggregates. We also see Lewy-like alpha-synuclein aggregates form after injection of alpha-synuclein fibrils into the striatum of wild-type mouse. And also, Alpha-synuclein fibrils and aggregates can be taken up by neural axons to undergo axon transmission, promote misfolding and fibrillization of host alpha-synuclein, and induce formation of inclusions in cytoplasmic axons of, of, of substantia nigra of dopamine neurons, resulting in neurodegeneration other abnormalities and transmitted to unaffected healthy 